All right, I'm turning this mic on. This is great. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Aaron. What's your name? All right, you guys are called Chris. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm going to be practicing my, my uh, improv comedy routines while I'm up here, uh, as well as introducing you to Luigi. Um, I'm interested in knowing the, the makeup of the group here. Um, how many of you would self-identify as a, a data scientist? Um, how many of you would consider yourself a web developer? Okay. Um, what other categories <laughs> are we missing here? That's about a third of you. Okay. Anybody here just like really new to Python? Okay. All right, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Um, I myself um, am a, a, I guess I, I would consider myself a web developer um, to start off with. Uh, so that's kind of the direction from which I'm gonna be approaching a bunch of this stuff. Um, so, all right, let's uh, go ahead and move along on these slides here. Um, if you haven't installed this stuff or cloned these repos yet, then we'll have some more time to do that later. Um, I know that the internet connection here is kind of spotty, so we'll just um, have to make do uh, as we go along. Um, this is a slide with a picture of like some pipes and wrenches and stuff on here. Um, it's supposed to make us feel like we're uh, making a pipeline. Um, and uh, at the bottom is my name and my job title. I'm a full stack engineer at a company called Voxy. Um, and Voxy is a web app that um, it basically teaches people English. Uh, we make like a dynamic uh, English language learning platform that we sell to uh, universities and language schools and so on. And like I said, I'm a, I'm a web developer there uh, primarily, but um, when I came into the company, uh, I somehow got stuck with working on this uh, data pipeline that had been built by previous generations of folks who worked at the company. Um, and so I, I had to learn how to do um, some, not so much uh, data analysis. Uh, I, I don't have, you know, I'm not really great at statistics or anything like that, um, but just keeping this thing up and running. Um, so the way that we use data at Voxy is basically we have a web app and some mobile apps and so on that um, have different things that happen that we want to know about, different events. Um, so a great example of that would be a page view event. When a user comes, looks at a page, um, of course we're like capturing that with uh, Google Analytics and so on, uh, but we also want to be able to analyze that information uh, in a deeper way, so we capture a page view event. Um, and then there's a bunch of steps that I'm skipping over, um, but eventually what's gonna happen with that is it's gonna end up in a file, in a bucket on Amazon S3. And we do that for a bunch of different, this is like three examples of events that we use, um, but there's a bunch more. Um, and so those go to S3, and from there, um, we use a we use a uh, AWS data pipeline service. It's kind of like a it's kind of like a fancy cron job, if you will. Um, and we are going to like spin up a bunch of servers and then um, execute various things in each of those servers. Um, we create a an Amazon EMR cluster, which is basically the version of Hadoop. Um, it's a cluster of servers with a, a master server that is um, farming out jobs to a bunch of the um, a bunch of the uh, slaves, and then we do some processing in the Hadoop cluster, and then move the results of that to a Redshift database. Redshift is another. You can see we're very uh, very all in on Amazon, uh, but Redshift is basically a Postgres database. Um, in Amazon. And then we use a service called Chartio to read from that database after doing some more 
um, work in the Redshift. Uh, we read from it with a tool called Chartio, and then we expose that to like people inside of the company and then also to our customers. There's, um, we, some of this data is actually being looked at by customers, and so it needs to be fairly reliable. It needs to be something that you, know, you can't just say, oh, sorry, it didn't work today. Um, it needs to pretty much work every day. Um, so you guys aren't here to hear about my, uh, my company or what we do. You probably want to learn a little bit about Luigi and building data pipelines with it. Um, so Luigi is, um, it looks like this. It was created by Spotify and um, its logo is made of little pipes again. I think the name comes from like uh, the Mar Super Mario Brothers character. And um, this is how Luigi self-describes. They say that it's a Python package that helps you build complex pipelines of batch jobs. It handles dependency resolution, workflow management, visualization, handling failures, command line integration, and much more. Um, and just to boil that down a little bit, I think Luigi is useful if you have um, a batch job that has a bit of complexity to it and you need to run it not just once but multiple times, then if you meet those criteria, I think Luigi is a pretty good um, tool to try to use for that. Um, just a show of hands, do any of you feel like you might have a situation like this? Excellent, yes. Awesome. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to give you a, a ridiculous example of uh, the kind of thing that Luigi does. I'm going to talk about how to make spaghetti. Um, I don't know, the Luigi, Italian, I don't know, just free association here. How do you make spaghetti? So if you look at a, at a recipe, um, recipes are usually written very linearly, right? You do this, and then you do that, and then you do that. It's got a series of steps, and if you follow those steps... Um, you know, presumably you, you can make uh, some spaghetti here. Um, and that's one way of thinking about a recipe. Um, here's another way of thinking about a recipe and how that works. Um, if anyone's wondering, like, if anyone's uh, thinking this uh, type is too small, it's because it doesn't matter. You guys know how to make spaghetti. Uh, so here's another way of thinking about that. Um, in terms of a tree of dependencies, right? So if you think about what you're doing when you're making a spaghetti, right? So at the very end of the process, what you're going to do is you're going to have some sauce, and then you're going to have some noodles, and you're going to put them together somehow, right? I don't know if you guys like to mix your sauce in with the noodles, or you like to put it on top, but at the, the end of this process, you're going to be putting those two things together, right? Um, these noodles, the stuff that's happening to the noodles over here is pretty independent of whatever's happening to this sauce, All right? So let's say I get to this stage, I got, some, I got some spaghetti and I've got some noodles, and oh no, I dropped the noodles on the floor, they're all ruined, right? Uh, I wouldn't want to go back to the beginning of the process. Uh, I wouldn't want to go back to step one and start cooking a bunch of like onions and green peppers and whatever. Right? You already have some sauce over here. You don't need to redo this part. You just need to redo this part over here. Um, and uh, you can also see that there's some um, like common dependencies with some of this stuff. For example, um, heating oil is something, if you, uh, if you make a, a spaghetti sauce with vegetables and meat in it, um, heating oil is something that is common to both of those tasks, right? So you could consider that like a, a shared dependency here. Um, so that's essentially how you think about running jobs when you're using Luigi. Um, it's a, a bunch of discrete tasks that you create dependencies between, right? So if, if bringing water to a boil was, this would, this would be one Luigi task, and then adding pasta to the water would be another Luigi task, and you would set up a dependency relationship between those. And the way that you do that is um, with three methods. 
that you are going to... So a Luigi, one of these steps here is going to be a Luigi class. It's going to be a class that inherits from one of the Luigi modules, um, or one of the Luigi classes, rather. And then in your subclass, you're going to define run, output, and requires. So let me give you just a briefest of overviews of what that looks like. I have some task here that inherits from a Luigi task. And the run method is what's actually doing the work. So this is what's boiling the pasta. Um, the output method is how we figure out whether that step is done or not. So here, um, it has basically the output, you return a target. And the target is just going to have one method, which is exists. And exists is going to return true or false. If it returns true, that means this task is done. Don't do it again. If it returns false, it means we need to execute this run method. Um, and then the third method is requires. And that is going to be, you're going to return uh, a list, or you could also return a single task. But what you're returning here is another one of these, another task. If this doesn't depend on anything else, then you don't need to implement the requires method. You can just leave it out. Um, and using those three methods, that's how you're going to build up this dependency tree. And that's how you're going to um, uh, keep track of which parts of, of your process are finished and which parts still need to be executed. All right, so that's just like a, a very basic overview. Um, and here's how you would run that. You would start up a Luigi uh, daemon. Um, this is going to be your scheduler. So it's like a, a process that runs and just keeps track of which things um, need to be run. Uh, and then you're going to run the file, run the, uh, the class in the file where you defined it. All right, so we're going to do this together. Um, you can either type along with me, like copy what's on the slides and type it along. Uh, if you're saving your fingers for better things, um, you can also, uh, you can also, uh, there's a, a Git repository, the Hello World Git repository that uh, asks you to clone. Um, that also has each of these steps and each uh, commit is one of the steps. So you could just read along with that. Um, but it's fun to type things as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to, this is the most ridiculous Hello World program you've ever seen. We're going to um, write hello in a file, okay? And then we're going to write world in another file. And then we're going to read the contents of those two files and concatenate them. And then we're going to output that to a third file, okay? So you're going to have one file that says hello, another that says world, and then a third file that says hello world. Um, and we're going to use Luigi for no reason other than because that's what this session is about. Okay, so here's how it goes. Um, and again, feel free to, uh, to you know, do this yourself. Uh, so we're going to start by importing Luigi. And you define a class that inherits from the Luigi task.
And if you want, I think you should be able to run it at this point, if I'm not mistaken. I'll come back to this for those that want to continue typing it, but this is how you would run that. Again, start up a Luigi Demon, set it to run in the background so that you don't have to keep uh, multiple tabs open. Um, you don't strictly have to point to a log directory, but it helps so that you don't have these uh, extra log files sitting around. And then you're going to just run the file and then pass it the name of the class. And that should work and it should output a hello.txt file with the word hello in it. Does anyone know anything about installing modules in a Jupyter Notebook? I'm not a Jupyter Notebook user myself. What's that? It's the same. And you should just pip install and then refresh the notebook. Pip install. Has anyone gotten that into uh, run yet? Does anyone need me to stay on the slide? Okay. Okay, um, so the next thing uh, I want to try doing is um, we're going to pretend that this takes a really long time to do. Okay, so import um, the uh, import sleep, the sleep function, and we're just going to sleep for 60 seconds at the, at the top of this run method. Um, and then once you've done that, try running it again, and you're going to see that it's going to run the same job again, and it's going to take 60 seconds this time. So I'll put it back here. This has most of what the other file had anyway.
So who's run it again and seen it take 60 seconds? Anybody gotten there yet? Okay. That's annoying, right? Because you know you already have that file that says hello. You don't need to run it again and print hello to the file again when it takes so long. Right? Am I right? Um, so the way that you're going to get around that is next we're going to implement this output method. And that's going to return a local target and it's going to point to the file that we created, the hello.txt file. So, quick show of hands, who's ready for me to go on to something else and who's ready for me to, okay, ready for me to go on to something else and needs to stay on this slide some more. Okay, just... Yeah, sorry, um, just wanted to, a few people are having trouble running the, the program. Um, and uh, I think the reason is uh, this line here, like this is something that needs to be run in a, in a terminal, in like bash. So you're, you're calling the file, but then you're also passing in the specific, the name of the class that you're, that you're running. Uh, well, this, this, what you pass in here, this hello task right here, needs to match the, the class name. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, so we've got a hello task with a sleep in it, and then we've added an output there so that you can rerun it again now and you don't have to wait, right? If you run, if you run this again, you should just see that that file is already done. Okay, um, so now we're gonna do a speed round. We're gonna go and add a world task that does pretty much the exact same thing. I changed the sleep here to 30 seconds just because, but you can put the sleep as whatever you want it to be. 
Um, so again, same thing, just a, a different task, um, and we're making a world.txt file instead of a hello.txt. Uh, it also has an output method and so on. So he had a question uh, about what is the output actually doing? Um, because it, it, it runs fine without it, right? So what the output is doing is it's saying if you already have this file world.txt, if that file is already in the location on the file system where we're pointing to, don't run this task again, right? So that's what we're demonstrating with these sleeps is like, you don't want to wait around for something to execute when you already, you've already executed it, right? Um, Say that again? I guess you just have to give a new name for each for the file name if you wanted them to run it as a file, right? Yeah, so we're going to definitely get to that in a little bit. His, his question was like, what if you actually want to write this file every time, right? Like, let's, if you're putting new data in it or something like that, and uh, the short answer to that is that you're going to give it a, a unique location, um, and we'll get to how to do that. Um, so yeah, go ahead and like run the world task if you haven't already. Um, it, you know, again, you just from a command line, you're going to run hello world.py, pass in the world task, and it should run successfully. And if you run it again after that, um, it should show another success message, but happen a lot faster because you're not waiting 30 seconds. I'm going to leave this up here while we're while you guys are running that
Test. Are we ready to put those together in the Hello World task? Mm -hmm. So again, we're inheriting from Luigi.task. We have a run method. This one's a little bit more complex, but basically it boils down to you open the hello.txt file, you save its contents to a variable, open the world.txt file, save its contents to a variable, you start writing hello world.txt, you put the content in there from those two variables, um, and you close the file at the end. Um, you can probably guess that you're going to add an output method for this Hello World class. Um, it's going to return a local target for a file called Hello World.txt. Um, and then we're going to do the requires method that we talked about earlier. And this one is going to return a list. And in the list, you're instantiating the Hello task and the World task that you wrote before. Feel free to now to sleep to this, just again, to simulate a task that takes a while to run. Um, those sleeps are also going to help us in a few minutes when we, uh, we're going to look at a cool visualizer that Luigi gives us.
And then, of course, feel free to run the Hello World task whenever you're, whenever you're ready to do that. Okay, so let's just go ahead and remove the hello and world files that you created. And if you haven't already, do the uh, start up the Luigi daemon. Um, and this time I'm passing a port. That's actually the default port, so you don't need to worry about passing it explicitly. But this is the port we're going to be running it on. It's 8082. And then if you run your hello world task, um, you can pass in a worker's argument. Again, it's not necessary, but you can. Uh, and then uh, you should be able to go to localhost um, port 8082, and you're going to see a nifty visualizer that looks something like this. Um, and that's going to show you the, uh, the tasks that are running, which ones are pending. It'll show you, you can take a look at a, a dependency graph and so on. The um, question was whether the dependency graph works only for running tasks. Um, I believe it doesn't. It, it'll, uh, any task that you, uh, that you run, it should show the whole. You might need to select the parent, like the, the top level hello world task, and then I think it'll show the dependencies under that. Yeah, just uh, you know, play around with this visualizer. Look at the stuff that it shows you. It's it's kind of cool. I personally don't use it a ton, um, but it's good to know that it's there. If you you know, if I'm, for example, if I'm trying to explain to a, a new coworker how this whole Luigi thing is working, I might come to this visualizer and and you know, show all the tasks that are running and the dependency tree and all that sort of stuff. Um, so we're going to, yeah, you had a question? It might, yeah, it might, it might, you might have to manually refresh the page. I'm not sure. Uh, I, actually, I'm not sure about that. I, th I think it runs on Tornado. No, I, you might have to refresh the page. I'm not sure. Like I say, it's not something that I use day to day. It's like a a nice every now and then sort of thing to be able to go in and look at, at those tasks. Okay, so we're going to do something uh, a little more fun now. Um, we're going to, so uh, the gentleman in the front here asked earlier about uh, what if you do want to replace the contents of that file, right? You have a hello world file, so you have a hello file and a world file and then a hello world file. And once you run the task, if you run it again, um, it just says, oh, I'm done. 
So it's not going to change the contents of those files. It's going to consider um, that task having been done just because those files are in, in the place where um, you're pointing to. Um, so if you do want to update, like a very common use case for Luigi would be running like a, like a, nightly, a daily or nightly job, right? If you want to get a bunch of data and do stuff with it on a daily basis, um, you want to have new data every day, right? And so how do you do that? Um, and the answer is that you need to um, parameterize the jobs. OK, so we're going to do this again. Um, but this time, we're going to create um, a Hello World file in a specified directory every time we run the job. OK, so the way to do that is to uh, name a parameter. So we're going to name a parameter called ID. And then it's equal to a Luigi.parameter. And you can give it a default if you want. You don't have to. And then in the output, the path is going to take that ID and stick it somewhere in the path. So I'm going to put it, I'm going to say inside of, we're going to make a directory called results. And then under results, we're going to have the ID that you pass. And then under that, we're going to have your hello world file. Move on. If no one has any objections. Um, so now, in the requires method, you're going to need to pass something down to the hello task and the world task. Right? In this case, um, I just chose to um, pass down a path instead of instead of passing the ID itself. I'm going to create a path here um, and then pass it down. So again, under the results directory, we're going to have some identifier and then a hello.txt file and a world.txt file. And you can probably anticipate that what's going to happen next on the following slide will be the hello task and the world task you're going to create a, a uh, Luigi parameter called path so that it can take this as an argument. Move on. Sure. Yeah. Question. So, uh, before you run this, are you going to have to make like a results directory, or will it be exported? Oh man, you ruined my surprise. Are we going to have to make a results directory before we run this? Um, the answer is yes, but we're going to get Luigi to do it for us, right? You could manually create a results directory. 
Um, but you're still, like, whatever ID you pass in here, we're going to need to make that directory as well, right? So you don't want to be doing that manually every time you run it. Um, we're going to get Luigi to do it for us. Um, so again, for the hello task, now we've passed in the path. We're creating a path parameter. Um, and now you're going to use that path parameter. Um, now you're opening the file at that path. And that's what you're writing to. And again, I'm not, I, didn't, I didn't create another slide for the world task, but you're doing the same thing for the world task. Adding the path parameter, opening the file at that path. And then in the output, um, you're passing that path for the local target as well. Will anyone be distressed if I move along? Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, now the run method here um, for the Hello World task. Uh, what we're going to do is um, the, the Hello World task has now two inputs. Um, one of them uh, is the hello file, and then the other one is the world file. And you can, I, you can refer to those like this if you say self.input and an index. So that's going to be the first, the first item in your requires method. So in our requires method, we, we pass down uh, the hello task, and the second, we, we uh, pass it the... Uh, or not pass, but we, we list the hello task, and then the second is the world task. So you can refer to them as self.input at index zero. And then it has a path. This path actually doesn't come because we named the Luigi parameter path. This is just something that, that um, I believe this is true. This is something that um, that has because of its, of its uh, output. The uh, local target gives us that, that um, dot path attribute. Okay, so you're going to refer to these files like that now. Um, and then also in the run method, um, the file that we're writing to, we can refer to as self.output.path. Because your hello world task has an output, which is going to the file uh, at um, uh, results slash some ID slash hello world dot text. And this is a way to get that without duplicating that string. And everything else about those those uh, everything else about the code should be the same. Is that clear? Um, and so here's the, here's the surprise that um, the guy here ruined. Thanks a lot. Uh, which is that if you try to run this now, you're getting, a, you're getting an error because the directory is not found. Um, and so um, we need to add another class. Um, this one is going, we're going to call it make directory. It's just another Luigi task. It's also going to take a path. Um, its output, it's, sorry, its output is the path that we give it. Notice that this, in this case, the path is a, it's going to be a directory rather than a file, right? But that's totally fine. And that's going to create a directory. And then when you call run, we're just going to make a directory at that path. 
So we're not going to be we're not going to be passing down the path to the individual files. We're going to be passing down the directory that those files are going in. Okay, so now I have like a, a quiz question for you. What do you think we're gonna do with make directory? Any guesses? Yes. Add it to hello world as a requirement. Any other uh, answers? The beginning of the run statement. Okay, if you put it at the beginning of the run statement, then you're gonna make the directory when you, when you run hello world. Okay, so the, another answer is added to the requires of the hello task and the world task, right? And that, that's, what, that's what we're going to do with it. Yeah, that, that's the right answer. So the reason that it wouldn't work to put it in the top level hello world class, especially in the runs method, is that that's not going to execute, that runs method is not going to, or, or is not going to execute until the, t the uh, tasks that are listed as the requirements have already completed. Right, so if, yeah, so we're gonna put this in the hello task. The hello task is gonna have a requires method that's gonna return make directory. You're gonna give it the path. And again, you don't wanna give it the path to the file itself, but you're giving it the path to the directory that the file is gonna be placed in. And then of course, duplicate this requires method in the, the world task as well. And since both of these, both hello task and world task are, they have the same requirement, the way that Luigi is going to handle that again is just, it's going to check if that directory has already been made, it's only going to run that once. Whoever gets to it first gets the honor of creating that directory. All right, I feel like you guys are getting the hang of this. I'm gonna go a little quicker. Um, so now we run this, and you're gonna pass in an ID. So notice that um, we created the parameter ID, and then that gets turned into an argument. So you pass, you give it a dash dash ID equals something, and that can be whatever you want it to be. Just try running that a couple of times. If you run it once with the ID of test, it should create the files again, and it's going to take you know uh, a minute or two to do that. And then if you run again with the same ID, it should just happen immediately. And then if you run it again with a different ID, it should create new files in a new directory. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, obviously, that's that's correct, right? Like, uh, uh, I don't know what, I don't exactly know what Luigi, how Luigi is deciding to to list these, um, but I don't think it's in the order that they're uh, that they are uh, executed in. And also, obviously, they're also not, it's not also in the order of like what's scheduled to run first, because like, hello task and world task are both at a, the same level of on the hierarchy, right? Alphabetical. Yeah, that's, that's what I was um, saying before, is that Luigi handles the scheduling of these things, so it's gonna say, okay, I see that there's, there are two, um, two tasks that require make directory. And then the Luigi daemon is just running in a single, it's just running a Python process in a single thread, and so it's just gonna go through one at a time until each one of these things is, is completed. Um, and so uh, 
it's just whatever, whichever one ends up executing first, that's the one that runs. And then when the, the uh, let's, say, let's say hello task is the first one that executes, right? Um, hello task requires make directory, it makes the directory. And then world task comes along and, and checks its requirements and it sees that make directory has already completed and so it's not gonna do it again. Yeah, if, the two, if there's two different make directories, and we'll see that in a few minutes, but if there's two different make directories and they have different arguments, uh, or not different arguments necessarily, but if they're creating different files, then they're gonna run, uh, it, it would run more than once, one for each, each um, file that it's creating. Um, so the one thing I don't like about what we've written so far is that there's some like, kind of annoying duplication between the hello task and the world task. They're both doing the exact same thing. And uh, um, so let me just give you one more example of, of uh, how we might um, unnecessarily com uh, complicate this silly hello world program, uh, which is I'm going to make a print word task, and it's going to take the path, but it's also going to take the word that we're going to print. And here, I'm just going to pass that word down here to um, the file that we're writing, and we're going to print whatever word you pass in. So you could pass in the word hello, you could pass in the word world, you could pass in another word if you wanted to go crazy. Right? And so then this print word task would replace, instead of having a hello task and a world task, now you're going to have a print word task you're going to pass in the words and and you're going to run it and like you were asking about if you if you run this um, I don't have the output on my slides here but if you run this you will see the um, the sorry you will see the print word task um, multiple times in the output Okay, so that's, that's all about parameterizing a pipeline. So we've got this silly hello world um, program now that um, you're creating files with and you see how to um, pass in parameters to each of these tasks. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, another, um, another aspect of Luigi, which is configuration. Um, it has this me uh, mechanism of adding configuration for your pipeline. Um, and the, the, uh, the standard way to do that is that you create a luigi.cfg file and put it in the directory um, where, you're running, where you're running your program. Um, and it has these sections um, where you pass in things. And these are two examples of um, built-in configuration that Luigi comes with. So in the core section, I'm gonna pass a, a, an IP address of the scheduler host. So if I wanted to put my Luigi scheduler, like the, the Luigi daemon process that we're running, if I wanted to put that on uh, a separate server, I could do that by passing in an IP address here, right? Um, or another uh, example of a core built-in um, configuration is the email. And uh, we use this at work. I get, when something goes wrong with my um, Luigi pipeline, I get a bunch of emails saying such and such task failed. Um, and another thing that you can do is you can explicitly set the path where that config file is placed. And what that's really useful for is having uh, a separate version of your um, pipeline running. Um, for example, a production pipeline, and then if you want to have a staging pipeline where you can make changes um, to your jobs and test that they have the effects that you expect them to have, um, you can have a separate staging and production pipeline. Um, and so there's, I showed you a couple of the built-in things, but um, getting into like really some of the useful aspects of Luigi is that it has a lot of modules that are already built for um, a lot of the things that you might want to use for various types of like data wrangling. Um, so, you know, a lot of major... Um, uh, 
databases, and there's Hadoop modules, and Hive, and Spark, Elasticsearch, and so on, plenty of others. And then each one of those will have, um, you, can, you can specify configuration, for example, for your, um, if you're using a MySQL database, then in your configuration file, you'll have a section there where you're going to uh, give it the, um, you know, the host and the port and the username and all that sort of information. And you can also create your own custom settings in the configuration. So, for example, um, later in the exercise we're going to do, uh, we, if, like the internet connection permitting, uh, we might try downloading some files from Amazon. And so I might want to make a custom S3 file section, and I might want to set a bucket name and a key name, and I might want to have two different versions of that, one for staging and one for production. And then, so again, I'm going to export the path to that configuration file like this so that I can have two different versions of where that file might be located or, or where I might want to put the file when I'm done. Okay, so I've created these custom sections and the way that that would work um, inside of Luigi is if you use the same name, the, the, the name of the section in that config file becomes the name of the class and then each of the keys in that configuration file become Luigi parameters. Um, and then if I, want to, uh, if I want to use these settings, then I can call like S3 file, instantiate that class, and then um, call the, or, or use the dot bucket attribute. Okay, so this would be some task that's going to output a file and put it on Amazon S3 at a certain bucket, in a certain bucket at a certain uh, key. All right, um, so we're going to do an exercise, but I think first uh, there's like a, on the schedule, there's like time for a, a break. I think this might be a good time to do that. Um, if you wanna take like 10 minutes um, to get water, use the bathroom and so on. We'll come back and then I'll explain this fun exercise.
if you, <clears throat> if you haven't gotten it already, this is where it's going to come in really useful to have this um, Luigi exercise template repo. So uh, if you could git clone that, that would, uh, that would be good. And who here downloaded the zip file of fake data? All right, at least a few people. Good, good. Uh, my, my biggest fear today was that uh, the internet connection would go out and we, no one would be able to have those files and we wouldn't be able to do much. I think we're mostly here now. Uh, a few people might still be outside, but um, yeah, if, if you have this um, Luigi exercise template repo, uh, that has the instructions for the exercise, um, but I'll also go through it up here on, on the screen. Um, so this is gonna last maybe an hour or so. Um, we'll, I'll, we'll cut it off at, at um, let's see, what time is it now? It's either, I'm on East Coast time, so I, I'm really not sure what, what time it is, but um, at like say 11.30 we'll cut it off and then, and then I have some more stuff to kind of uh, run through um, in the presentation. Uh, I'll give you an example of kind of a, a real world use case for, um, for Luigi. Um, but for this exercise, what we're gonna do is basically take some data, um, Download it from S3 if possible. Um, and then we're going to use Luigi to do some manipulation of that data. Okay, so we have a collection of user updates. So imagine that this is uh, information from a web application. And the web application has users. And every time a user updates some of their information, we're going to write out an event and stick it in one of these files. Um, and then we also have a page views file that every time a user visits a certain page, we're going to record that, put it in a log file, and stick it in the bucket on S3. Okay, so from that, we want to make a user page views table, and we're going to put that in a SQL database. So here's what, the, uh, here's what the user updates file is going to look like. Um, it actually won't have a header, but the data is uh, a user's ID, an email address, um, when this user was last updated, or, or when this update happened, rather. Um, and then the, the name, it also has an environment. I didn't have room for that on the slide, but that'll either be production or stage. So that's what that data will look like. And then we're going to have a page views file. This is in a different format. Um, this is, uh, each row is going to be a JSON blob, and it's going to have a user ID. So the user ID is what you're going to use to, to match the user update to the, the uh, page view event. It'll have the URL that the user visited, the timestamp when they visited that URL, and then it'll also have an environment 
which I didn't put on the slide here. And then what we're going to try to create is a table. It's going to have the user ID. It's going to have the, the most recent, and this is where the user updates is going to come in. It's going to have the user's most recent email address. If the same user changed their email address, we want the latest email address. Um, and then for each user ID, we're going to list out all the URLs that they visited and count how many times they visited that URL and when's the last time they visited that URL. Here's some things to think about. Um, let's imagine that this is something that you want to run on a daily basis. You're, you're getting new users visiting new pages every day, so you want to be able to run this daily. So we're going to use some of the parameterization that we looked at. Um, and then another thing to think about is that there are some duplicate rows. Uh, sorry, the, the process of saving these files isn't, um, isn't very trustworthy. And so you have some duplicate rows of data that you're going to need to um, remove. Um, I mentioned the environment. We don't care about stage data. We just want to know about production data. So you're going to need to filter the environment out. Um, and this is if you don't have a if you don't have a SQL database installed on your machine, you know, feel free to use whatever other data store you, you feel like, um, or you can generate uh, CSV files or whatever. Uh, any sort of like structured format for the output data. It doesn't have to go to SQL if you don't have that installed, but that would be my, uh, my uh, preferred place to put the data. Um, and if you're just like really fast, um, you get that done, no problem. Uh, something else you might try doing is creating a recommendations table. Um, and this would be for each user, given the pages that they've visited, what are other pages that they should probably also visit based on like comparing uh, page views for different users? And come up with any old crazy algorithm you want for that. Um, it doesn't matter. You're not getting paid for this. Um, and again, this is just kind of extra credit, something to do if you have done the other stuff and uh, are looking for some more, uh, more fun. Okay, so again, uh, the way to start this uh, is first clone this repo, and in the README for that, it'll have more details about the, the instructions for this, and then it'll also have an example.py file, uh, and that file is going to uh, uh, demonstrate a couple of the important steps for this. I tried doing this exercise myself a couple of weeks ago, and you know it took me like, you know, a couple of hours to do. So like, obviously, it's not going to, um, you know, if, if you've never used Luigi before, it's not going to be like immediately obvious exactly how to, how to, you know, plan this all out and so on. So the example.py file will get you started. That will uh, demonstrate downloading the files from um, AWS, from S3, and running a, uh, just like a shell script, and then it will demonstrate um, uploading some, uh, or it'll demonstrate loading some data from a CSV file into uh, a database, in this case, Postgres. Um, and then to download the, the, uh, to download the data, you're gonna need to use the credentials that are at this bit.ly link. Um, if you already have the zip files, um, that I sent an email out about. If you have the zip files, and if you're having trouble getting the data from S3, then you can just like copy-paste the, the contents of that zip file into the right location and, and just pretend that you downloaded them from AWS. That would be a way to do that. Um, is anyone here interested in like pairing with other people in the room to do this? All right, a bunch of lone wolves. Okay, so have fun with that. I'm just gonna be walking around. Uh, ask me questions if, you, if you'd like.
Okay, I've got my goofy headset on again. Um, so, by a show of hands, uh, who was able to get the example, like able to run the example.py? Okay, most of you. Most of you are able to run it. Um, was anyone able to, to output the table that we're looking for? Okay, this has been a failure. Um, but uh, does anyone feel like they have a good idea of how they were going to do that? Would anyone care to share what they were going to do or how you, how you imagined putting that together? You had your hand up? Yeah. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna type this out as you're saying it, and um, just put it on the screen here. So you said you had a you had a a task for getting what now? Getting the files. So which uh, the, the user update files, the page view files, both. Okay. Okay, so a generic f task here that took a folder, let's say, right? Okay. Okay, so that created a CSV file. Okay, and that that re that would require the clean user, correct? Okay. Did that also create a CSV file? Okay. So this went to a table. And this also, and you, you just, you didn't feel like you needed a, a separate step for converting that? Okay. So in the page view, in the clean page views task, you were going to use the data in the user table? Okay. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think that makes a lot of sense that you would probably want to put it in a separate, you probably want to have something above that that would be like a uh, create joined data or something like that that would require these. these. So now, now that this, this is putting the, the user data into a database and this is putting page views into the database, and then this is going to be some process that, and I assume that this would be like a, a SQL query that would create a new table with the joined data. Um, yeah, that's a super valid way of doing that. Anybody else do it significantly differently than this? There were some, uh, there were some duplicate rows of data. Did anyone have a, a an interesting way of removing the duplicates? Okay. 
Sorry? You always do that with what? On the database. Yeah, so you could do it on the database. Um, I actually, when I, when I was doing the example, I ended up doing it um, in like a, just a shell script. So I had a shell script that was um, concatenating all the, all the events of each type into a single file and then um, removing the, the uniques that way. You know, at the amount of data that we're working with here, lots of things work. Um, when you start working with lots and lots of data, you start running into various bottlenecks. Yeah. didn't entirely follow you, but I assume that that's a good way to do it, too. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay, so are you imagining, like, using, using an ORM for that? Okay. Yeah, that would work if you if you have an ORM and the ORM's handling like you know duplicate keys and, and that sort of thing, then that works too. Um, so obviously, like there's not really enough time to complete this task, but I hope that you can kind of like see the the, the shape of, of how you end up doing this. Um, you could go you could go crazy like like when you were describing how you created each one of these tasks. You had um, you had this step, clean page views, which was going to um, uh, take the files and, and then put them directly into a database. You could, you could have another task below that that was going to like concatenate the, the page views um, and then you could have another task that's going to you know, do something else like, like remove duplicates. And then you could have another task that's going to turn it into a CSV file first before turning before putting it in the database. It's really you know it's up to you. Like you guys are, uh, are developers, you know how to do this sort of stuff. But the idea is like you want you want a unit of work that is significant enough to to be worth the extra effort of writing these these classes, right? And um, it, it a good way to think about it is that you just want like a good save point so that if you, if something goes wrong you can you can see where which part of the process it, um, is breaking and if you need to re if you need to fix something and rerun it that you can um, you know you have plenty of places to to rerun from um, one other set of questions: Did anyone um, did anyone look at what's actually happening on the when you save the data to the database? Did anyone look at your list of tables that, that are generated from that? Um, so the when we were going through the examples before, all of the targets were local targets, which are generating files on the disk, and that's how Luigi tells whether the task has been run or not. Um, in the case of the database targets, uh, what it's doing is putting a, uh, it's creating a table called, I think, table updates is the default. And then table updates has rows. Each row represents um, one, one task. So if you give it a different ID, it's going to save, uh, it's going to save a row to table updates. It's going to have a, a different name. And then that's how Luigi tells whether that has been run or not. So that's how you can um, get your, your out output for table tasks. Um, another thing you probably noticed is that um, a few people asked me about the, uh, the let me pull it up here. So a few, a few people asked me about this class and why it didn't 
Um, why it didn't have a run method? This font size sucks. Hold on. Yeah, so why does write user updates to SQL not have a run method? Um, when I've told you that all these classes need to have a run method, and the, the reason for that, if it's not obvious, is that the copy to table class is the one that implements the run method. Right, so this is a, a common pattern in Luigi, is if you're gonna use these, these um, pre-built modules, instead of writing your own run method that's going to create a, a database connection and execute, you know, you have to type out all the SQL queries that you're gonna run and then close your connection, all that sort of stuff. Uh, this copy to table method is gonna do that for you. And the documentation is gonna show you that if you're gonna use this, you need to implement a, a you, need to, you need that class to have columns, and so the columns here are just, um, just hard-coded in, and then the rows are going to be lines that I'm reading from a CSV file in this case. And so that's how that works. So the parent class does have a run method, um, this class doesn't have a run method, instead it has rows and columns, and then the run class on that um, uh, copy to table class is gonna use that information to, uh, to run the job. Um, yeah, any other comments, questions? Non sequiturs. Um, so what I would like to do next is um, to just go through, I, I've like shared with you some kind of like toy examples of how, you know, how to use Luigi. Um, we wrote a little Hello World program, we, we did this exercise. Um, now I'm just going to give you kind of a, a, an overview of how I use Luigi in production. Um, and I think hopefully that will illustrate a few um, interesting aspects of using it, a few pitfalls and so on. So I showed you b before at the beginning um, that basically we have a web app that's creating all these events and the events are being saved to files on S3 much like the ones that you downloaded for that exercise. That's exactly what we're doing. Um, and then the way that we uh, start processing that is um, in Amazon there's a data pipeline service. So the data pipeline service is, like I said before, basically kind of like a fancy cron job um, it has its own like dependency tree sort of thing that it does. Um, kind of complicated looking, but for better or for worse, that's what we use to kick off the Luigi process. One of the downfalls of Luigi um, that uh, even, the, even the people who wrote it um, freely admit is that it doesn't have its own scheduler. So it's not something you can just like set up and, and uh, it has a scheduler that has something called a scheduler, but the scheduler that Luigi has is really just um, just putting those dependencies in order. Um, it doesn't have like a, something where you can set it to run on you know, Tuesdays at 4 a.m. So for that, you'll use a cron job or we use this data pipeline. Um, so in production, um, what I do with, uh, with that data pipeline is the data pipeline is, has the ability to like uh, create different um, resources. So one resource is a Hadoop cluster that has a few different servers um, in it. And then we also use just another standalone uh, EC2 instance, another server. Um, and I'll explain later what, the, what that does. But first, looking at the Hadoop cluster, um, in the master server for that Hadoop cluster is where um, I have Luigi running. Okay, so Luigi is running in that server, and it's running a job called pig jobs. Um, pig is a, it's a language for doing kind of like data manipulation. Uh, it, uh, it runs on Hadoop. And so we call it pig jobs. Um, and what that is responsible for, more or less, is pulling out those log files from the S3 bucket doing a bunch of transformations to that data, and then outputting some other uh, TSV files into another S3 bucket. So it's just files in and files out. 
Um, and here's the pig jobs class. Um, you can see here that I'm inheriting from Luigi wrapper task. And the difference between Luigi.task and Luigi.wrapper task is that the wrapper task is just meant to be a wrapper. It's just a, a, a list of requirements, basically. So you don't have any runs method. You don't have any output. All you have is a bunch of requirements. Um, I'm going to take. I'm going to create a flow ID parameter so that I can give it an ID and then either rerun the same job again or run a different job on a different time at a different time by giving it a different ID. Um, and then there's just a bunch of requirements. This is three of them because uh, that's how many fit on this slide nicely. But there's I don't know 25, 30, maybe 40 different um, requirements, and each one of those represents one. Um, TSV file that I'm uploading to um, S3. So notice that the names of these things are achievement tests to S3. You got to kind of think about it top down. Like, what is the last thing in this process that I want to happen? The last thing I want to happen is I want to take activity, the activities file, and move it to S3. So then digging down, into those requirements, if I look at activities to S3, what is it doing? It's taking the parameter again, the flow ID, so that we can identify whether this is the same task or a different one. And then, this is kind of interesting, it requires, this is also a wrapper task, all it has is requirements. In this case, it has two requirements, one is putting the TSV on S3, and the other is putting the schema in S3, um, pig creates file. It creates like a like TSV files, and then it also and that's just a bunch of data. And then it creates a schema file, which is some JSON that identifies which um, you know which fields uh, that TSV file contains, and like what the data types and that sort of thing. Okay, so it's it has it's going to have it's going to put the TSV file on S3. It's going to put the schema file on S3. But the interesting thing is that here, I actually, before I can put anything on S3, I need to actually have the file to put there, right? Um, if I were to just put that as another requirement in this list, there's no guarantee of order of these requirements, right? So I might move the TSV to S3 first, I might move the schema to S3 first, it's just like whatever happens first happens first, there's no guarantees there. Um, so I can't just put activities in this list. So instead, what I'm going to do is inject activities into each one of these as an argument, as a parameter. Does that make sense to everybody? OK. OK, so activities is the class that I was injecting into those two into those two uh, requirements. This is the one that's going to actually create the files. Okay, uh, it inherits from pigjob. Now this is just, this isn't like luigi.contrib.pigjob. This is just something that we wrote. Um, it also takes a flow ID, it has more requirements. Um, in this case, an activity for us is like, uh, like I said, uh, I work at a company that does, it's a educational project for learning English, and an activity for us is like, like a little game that someone plays to, to, uh, to pr presumably learn some English, right? So we want to know things about when the activity started, and then we have another event that we fire when the activity completes, and we also are going to want to join that with some information about the user themselves. Okay, so activities has these requirements. Again, they get the flow ID as well. Flow ID just kind of keeps getting passed down uh, throughout this chain. Um, so we have activities inheriting from pig job, and this illustrates a difficult, kind of tricky aspect of Luigi that I've found, which is like if you start trying to visualize what's going on, you have all of these activities has all of these requirements, right, and I kind of think of things visually, so I you know, imagine arrows going to all the requirements. Uh, but then it also has a relationship with its superclass. 
and then each one of these guys also inherits from the same superclass. So if we just have this pig job superclass, okay, we can kind of make sense of what's going on. But if you have like one, if you have these things inheriting from a bunch of mix-ins and, and you get too crazy with your superclassing, it can get really complex, really hard to, hard to keep track of what's going on um, and to debug. So I just wanted to point that out. All right, what does a pig job actually do? Um, it, in this case, like the uh, SQL uh, modules that we were looking at before, um, it, the base Hadoop, Hadoop job task is not going to, or is going to implement the run method. We're not gonna implement run in the pig job itself. Um, instead, we're going to give it a job runner. And the job runner is a class which takes a name and a flow ID. Um, in this case, the name is just going to be the name of the pig script that we're running. I'm not going to show you guys the pig script because this isn't a, you know, this isn't about pig. Um, it's about Luigi, but basically there's a script. It's in a .pig file, and we're going to get the name of that file from the name of the task. So the file is going to be named activities, or the file might be named activity starts. We're going to convert, you know, in, in, in production what I do is like convert activity starts into a, uh, into snake case, and then stick dot pig at the end of the name, and that's what the name function does. And then the pig script runner, its job is just going to be like passing all the right um, arguments to, to get the pig job to actually run. Um, this is where, if you're interested in like, in like running these things, um, you know, in, in Hadoop or something like that, Pig in uh, Luigi is not parallelizing all of these jobs. Uh, it's just kicking off jobs that are going to be, you know, in, in this case, uh, the Pig jobs run on the Hadoop cluster, and that's where the parallelization happens. Um, Luigi's just kicking them off. <clears throat> Um, so before I showed you activities and you saw that it had three different requirements, activity starts, activity completes, and user profiles. So here you see an activity start, um, and then it just has one requirement, which is a raw activity event. And the raw activity event is where I'm actually going to go get the files, concatenate them, create a, t create a TSV file from them, and then that is going to feed into these later. So that's kind of the, the, the bottom of the tree. Here's a, um, just kind of a summary of, of what's going on. We got the top pig jobs wrapper, which is requiring a few different, uh, a few different S3 files. Each one of these has a pig TSVs to S3 and a pig schema to S3. Both of, those, both of those jobs are going to require the individual um, class that will make the, the output file. And then that might have some more requirements, but at the end of the chain is just going to be a raw, uh, raw something event class. Any questions about any of that? Yeah, uh, how do we know when it's done? Uh, well, for each of these, it, it's going to be different for each one of these um, tasks because each one of them creates an, or implements an output method. So raw achievement test events uh, is going to output a file. Um, without getting into too many of the details, basically this is going to output a file in a directory somewhere, right? Uh, this is going to output another file in, an, in another directory somewhere. Um, this one is going to, this is an S3 target, so it's actually, it's considered done when it checks S3 and S3 says, yes, I have that file, right? So local file, local file, S3, and then later we'll get into some like database uh, outputs. Um, 
would you implement sanity checks in the output? Yeah, I, uh, that's a great question because we could have a file in the correct location with nothing in it, right? Um, hopefully, you're, hopefully each, I, mean, I, don't know, I don't know how you guys feel about testing and that sort of thing, but hopefully you're testing the actual function in your run method to make sure that it does what you think it does. Um, another thing that you could do is instead of using a built-in target like the local target, which is just looking at the file, um, you could also implement your own target, which is going to both check that the file is there and check that it has certain contents, right? So that's just a matter of writing your own target, which remember all it needs to have is an exist method. If it returns exist true, then it says yes, this is done. If it returns exists false, then no, it's not done. So you could implement that. Yeah. Uh huh. So the question is, where is the target? Where is the local target um, uh, relative to? And the answer is. I don't remember. Uh, I think the way that the way I've been showing you to to call these jobs by calling uh, the, calling like Python and then the name of the file and then the class, I believe when you execute it that way, it's it's relative to the where you're calling the function or, or where you're you know where where you're executing that that um, shell command. If the Luigi daemon is running on a different machine um, than the caller, where would the file be? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a use case that I've run into. Um, so getting back to what I was showing you before, there's this stuff that's happening in the Hadoop cluster, and that's all the stuff that I showed you just now um, that's running pig jobs. And then we have it scheduled so that this all completes first, and then it's going to run some other stuff on an EC2 instance. What that is for is we're going to run a Luigi job called all tables. And this is taking the data that we output um, from pig jobs, all those TSV files. It's going to copy that data, put it into the Redshift database. And then we're going to run some more transformations on the data in SQL queries. Now, why we do transformations in both pig jobs and SQL transformations is it's a story for another time. Uh, but that's, that's how it's done. Um, so yeah. Take the data from S3, move it to a database is basically, and then do some more stuff in the database is what this section of the pipeline is doing. Stepping into that, here's what all tables does. Again, it's a wrapper class, so it just implements requires. Uh, it's going to return a TSVs to Redshift class and a SQL transformations class. The TSVs to Redshift class is also a wrapper. And what I'm doing there is just a list comprehension, which is going to take all the tables that we're looking for and then require each one of them, passing in the table name. So then the TSV to Redshift class takes the table as an argument. Um, and this is inheriting from copy to table. This is just, this is just like the Postgres copy to table uh, class that we used in the example in the exercise. Um, and all it really needs is we need to implement columns. And we're going to get the columns from the pig schema file. I'm not going to show you the actual code to do that because it's boring. Um, you need rows. You get the rows from the TSV file that we generated. Again, not going to show you how that how I'm doing that, but it's 
done exactly like you think it might be done. Um, and then I'm going to give it an update ID. And so the update ID is just going to be the, we're just going to concatenate the, f the flow ID and the name of this task. And that's what's going to, uh, that's what we're saving into the table updates table in the database to show that each one of these TSV to Redshift jobs completes for a given flow ID. So then the other part, the other part that was running in that top level um, wrapper task was SQL transformations. Um, each one of these SQL transformations does its own special thing. So I have one called account creations that does something, another one that says all group memberships. And so each one of these is going to be basically a SQL query. Um, so this is just pointing to a file that has the SQL query in it. Um, it has a table name. And it's going to depend on the particular, the, the particular tables being in the database that we're looking for. Um, is, it, is it clear to everyone why I implement? So before you saw that we're running TSVs to Redshift and SQL transformations. Wouldn't you kind of think that all of the tables would already be there when you run the SQL transformations? Like, why would I need to add TSV to Redshift in this requires method and give it the table that I'm looking for? Shouldn't the table already be there at that point? The reason that it, the reason that I'm including it here in the requirements is Remember that these, this requires method is unordered. It's a list, but it's unordered, right? So probably, to be honest, like a, a tuple is probably a better way. Of, and you can, you can uh, return a tuple from a re requires method, and that's probably a better way of um, returning it, just to, just to be clear that this is not really ordered. Um, so when... Uh, Sorry, when this TSV to red, wrong one. When, when account creations runs, I need to make sure that this user profiles table is in the database, because if it's not there, I'm either going to fail this task or I'm going to get an inaccurate result, because I'll be using like the previous day's data. Um, account creations inherits from a SQL transformation uh, class, and the SQL transformation class is basically just going to open up the SQL file that I defined in the child class, and then return that as the query. And that works because it's inheriting from Redshift query. The Redshift query um, built-in module just asks you to define a query. So it's just going to execute whatever SQL we feed it. All right, so going back and, and looking at that from a big picture again, um, I'm running all tables that has two parts, TSVs to Redshift and SQL transformations. This is just a list of all the tables I want to put onto the database. Um, this is a series of transformations, and each one of those might have its own requirements and so on, and each one of those is going to have a, a SQL query associated with it. Any questions about this section? Right. Um, we're entering the home stretch here. Um, just a few things to keep in mind if you decide to use Luigi is, like I was pointing out before, uh, just be kind of wary of using complicated inheritance um, because it, it does get really mind bendy if you have a lot of requirements and a lot of inheritance going on at the same time. You find yourself drawing these weird mental maps. Um, a 
few words that you'll often hear in relationship to, uh, to Luigi are um, that each job needs to be atomic, meaning it's, 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 uh, it's either done or it's not done. So, for example, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to execute some SQL query, right, rather than, let's say we're going to load data from a, from a file, it's better to create a temporary table, load all the data into that temporary table, and then rename the, the temporary table to, to be um, the, the name that you want, rather than just like writing some rows to the table at a time. The reason for that is if you were to run that same task again, you wouldn't want um, Luigi to think that that was done when it wasn't. Does that make sense? Um, it should be idempotent. This is one of those great words. I love it. Um, it means that when you run the, when you run the, ch the uh, task again, it should have the same results. So I should be able to call the same task with the same ID as many times as possible and get the same results, right? And you should, it should definitely be identifiable, so definitely you know, pass the IDs, pass those ID parameters around liberally so that you uh, can identify whether this is the same task or, or a different one. Um, I might have mentioned this maybe to a few of you in, in uh, individually, but uh, Luigi doesn't have its own, its own schedule. No, I, I did say this to the entire group. Luigi doesn't have a scheduling built into it, so that's something that you'll either need to run it from a cron job or run it in the, uh, some service like the AWS data pipeline service and so on. The built-in modules are really great for doing anything with databases, Elasticsearch, um, uh, you know, Hive, any of that sort of stuff. And uh, another thing I haven't talked about, but you should definitely think about if you're going to use Luigi, is to think about uh, monitoring and alerting. Uh, I pointed out the email configuration that you can set up that'll alert you when something goes wrong. Um, but another example of, ha of monitoring uh, that we use in our Luigi pipeline is we have like StatsD um, that we increment when certain, uh, when certain tasks have finished. So like if I'm expecting a certain number of tables to have been output in a given day, I'm gonna, every time I output a table, I'm going to increment stats D and then have um, something watching that to make sure that I have as, as much data as I expect. Um, that's pretty much the end. This is me. Please, if you decide to use Luigi, um, I'd love to hear about how you're going to do that. And uh, happy to answer any questions about this session or if you want to complete the exercise that we started working on and ask me anything about that, I'm, I'm glad to respond. The end. <laughs>